Our final speaker for the first day of the Maneuver Warfighter Conference enlisted in the United States Army in October 1987 as an artilleryman. Among his assignments, he has served in combat in Operations Desert Storm, Iraqi Freedom, Inherent Resolve, and Enduring Freedom. He was sworn in as a 16th Sergeant Major of the Army in August of 2019. It is my pleasure to introduce the Sergeant Major of the Army, Michael A. Grinston. Okay, there we go. It's, it's a test. Is um, you know, the microphone work? Can you get up and you stay? I'm going to move around. I'll keep is I'll, I'll keep 80 feet between me and Sergeant Major Hendricks. So I'm really happy to be here. I'm really proud. Um, I think I've almost talked at all the maneuver conferences since I've been the Sergeant Major of the Army. I know we had the virtual, but I was here. I'm very proud. In 2019, you got both the Chief of Staff of the Army and the Sergeant Major of the Army, and now you're just kind of stuck with me. So this is what you get. But I'm really proud to be here, and, and I, I say this with all sincerity. Um, you know, as a you know, as a career artillery soldier, I understand that the hard ground combat is done, and it comes through the maneuver center. And I completely respect that. And that's why one of the reasons every time this comes up every year, I say, this is a priority for the Army. And you're going to hear that come out. This is a priority for the Army. Um, because when every, anything gets really done and it's really going to be hard, and then we hit the easy button, 90% of the time we're calling on some force that comes through the Maneuver Center to execute the task for the country. And I think this is extremely important to be here with you today. So thank you um, to Sergeant Major Gardner and General Hodney and your team for here. Everybody that's actually had me here. Say again, did I mess it up already? Okay, I'm sorry. You know, General Burris. Um, so <laughs> I know. Donahue, sorry. <laughs> I know, and you're recording it. This is even better, right? Okay. Um, thanks for having me today. And uh, if you just keep your mask on, I won't see when you're laughing at me. <laughs> okay. So I, I will say right up front, I thank you uh, for having me here today. And please ask really hard questions, okay, because when I'm out there, I ask hard questions to you all. Isn't that correct? Um, so I, I ask that right up front. So I appreciate that. And before I even get started, I do want to talk about the Secretary of the Army. The Secretary of the Army put out six objectives recently, and I'm going to kind of look through, and I want to make sure that everybody in the Army gets these objectives. And I want to talk about that a little bit. So I'm proud to represent the Chief and the Secretary of the Army, but these objectives are very clear, and she wrote those in a memo, and I want to share those with everyone, and then I'll talk about where we're at. These are six objectives. Um, number one, we want to put the Army on a sustainable strategic path. She said those words very clearly, sustainable strategic path. And, you know, it may imply, are we on a, strategic, uh, a sustainable strategic path? Can we sustain the operational tempo with the funding that we have for the next few years? And that may be some of the questions, but that's number one objective. And I'm not sure if they were in, you know, priority order, but it was the first one in the letter was a sustainable strategic path. Number two, we want to become a, a more data centric army that's able, able and capable and adaptable enough to react to what's going on in the environment. Data centric. So... When you look at project convergence, can we adapt quickly enough? Um, data centric. Number, number three, climate change. We have to look at what is the environment doing uh, to our country and to our army. And some people, well, you know, let's just take, you know, a hurricane and it comes through and it hits, if it hits Fort Benning, if it hits Fort Jackson, if it hits somewhere, and that's at a higher rate than it's ever been, that has an effect on what happens in the, in the Army. And how do we adapt to that? Number four, 
Uh, we have to reduce those harmful behaviors that uh, we've been talking about probably for two to three years now. And uh, hopefully that should be no surprise to anyone. And then last, you heard it from a lot from General Funk today too, was we want to recruit and retain talent. And how do we do that? And we need everybody's help to do that. So those are the six objectives that were put out by the Secretary of the Army. And in that memo was very clear, though, that the priorities of the Army still remain people, readiness, and modernization. So when you look at the memo, it, it's in there. It actually says that. So we have the objectives from the Secretary of the Army, but our priority. And when you listen to the objectives, you can tie them back to almost those, those three areas. Re recruit and retain talent. You know, people. We have to be a relevant and ready Army, and that's through our people. And so the priorities for the Army still have not changed when the objectives, but I wanted to share those with you. But now as we look at the, the people part of this and the readiness, um, those are still the priorities. And let's go to, if there is a slide, go to the next slide. It's just going to be a cool photo. There you go. Um, something about your memory and, you know, you can look at a photo and say, wow, that's pretty cool, Sergeant Major. And it may not have anything to do with what I'm saying. Um, but it does. <laughs> So, yeah, yeah, I know, it's crazy. So, when the chief of the staff, so we have these objectives, we still have people first. What a lot of people, I think, heard, when the, people, when the chief said, people first, it was like this people first versus readiness. We don't have to be lethality. We just do people first stuff. That is absolutely incorrect. Lethality, lethality, lethality. Um, we have to be ready. In order to be ready, you got to be lethal. You have to know your job. And if you don't know your job, how are your people going to be ready? And how can you be more lethal? Um, it does start with people, but when you say people first, does it mean you ignore readiness or lethality? It's actually incorrect. I think it would be exact opposite of that. So when I think of my people, I start with, okay, how do I build a lethal, cohesive team? So we talk about this cohesive team. If I build a really good cohesive team and I'm going on a, an objective, if I don't have a cohesive team, how can I go on an objective and be more lethal? To me, it doesn't make any sense. So when the chief said people... First is our, is our priority. It didn't mean we got rid of readiness and doesn't mean that we are going, we're going to just forget lethality. And here's what, I, and now, you know, because I like to give a little more specificity on what we're going to do. What, okay, so what, what are we going to do to build a more lethal squad? Right? You know, Sergeant Major of the Army, kind of by doctrine, you know, NCOs are responsible for small teams and crews, and every once in a while we like to take that out of the Army 7.0, and then we like to bring it back in, and then we put it in the pages in the back. But it's still in there, in our Army doctrine, individual small teams and crews. So people are ready, um, people first, readiness equals lethality, and how do we build lethality? Um, what I've asked us to try to do is look at how better can we look at our expert infantry badge. And how many times can you do it? And I really appreciate Sergeant Major Trainus in the 10th Mountain Division. And what they did was, why do we, you know, and I still remember this as a brigade Sergeant Major, we shut down the entire brigade and we're going to work on this for 45 days. And at the end of that 45 days and two years, we're going to run EIB for five days. So our major trainers said, in the 10th Mountain Division said, we're not going to do that. You're going to build those skills over time. You get a few days for the setup, and then we're going to run EIB. And then we're going to do it again. And then we're going to do it again. Right? I think it's three times in one year, roughly. 
That's where we're going with lethality. And that's what I'd like all of us to do, is how can we build reps and sets with a foundation of good people that they have those opportunities to become a more lethal squad? If we make it easier on our organizations, then we can just do it over and over and over. If we don't, then it, it takes too long and we don't get the reps and sets. And I, I really want to thank uh, Sergeant Major Trainus and the 10th Mountain Division for doing that. But we, now we need to get this out to the rest of the Army. And the goal is for all organizations to be able to do the expert infantry badge, expert field medical badge, and the expert soldier badge. And let's not try to make it so hard um, that we have to wait two years to do it. You should have more opportunities to go train. If you don't get it, well, in three months, you can go try it again. That makes us more lethal, that you know how to do your basic warrior task in battle drills, and that's the goal of the Army. So that's one thing we're trying to do. The second thing is basic leader course. And we had a little discussion about PME, and I look forward to your questions. And if I can't answer, I also have my, my good friend for the trade ops sergeant major uh, for all enlisted PME right here, help me out. Um, but in the basic leader course, we're, I really want to bring back land nav. Again, I want to make more lethal folks. And if, if we look at some of the things you talked about in the academics today, right? Um, you know, are we going to have like all the GPS that we need? Or are we going to be able to have to go back and know how to navigate on the ground with a map and a compass? In a degraded environment, can we operate in small teams and crews to a point with commander's intent? And I think uh, we own that. And so we're looking at bringing back land nav in the basic leader course and the FTX. So bring back the, so the, the field training exercise and, and how do you have a culminating event? Now, we're not there yet, and the trade acts are major, so don't walk out of here and say, next week, we're going to have that. Um, but that's the goal, and we're building more lethal teams, and that's the whole goal in that. Okay, next slide. Um, did I say that too quickly? I'm from Alabama, so I don't think I talk too fast. Um, can you go next slide? Okay, good. Here's the second thing that uh, the goal for the Army. I always I wanted to do this. It's taken us about two and a half years. This year, we're going to have a best squad competition. So in your prep, like right now, if you're just doing like an individual team and you got your best soldier and your best NCO, you're, you're missing the other half. This year, the Army is going to have a best squad competition. And most people, it's our major. Um, but what does a squad look like? Now, you know, no, it's not going to be a nine-man squad, staff sergeant with two team leaders. I I'll tell you now, most people, Sergeant major, that's not right. I got it. Um, we want to broaden up the horizon, and what, a, what does a squad look like? Um, so... I know in an infantry squad what a squad looks like, but we need to broaden that up. We're going to look at it so we, we still have a group. And basically, you know, I understand it's probably going to be about five individuals. Um, and we're going to assess them on their leadership abilities to operate as a small team and crew. It's not going to be perfect. I acknowledge that, but we are still going to do it. Uh, Get your five folks together at the smallest unit possible. Um, so in other words, don't build the super squad to come to the best warrior competition. It's designed that you have your teammates appear for the Army. So as you prepare for this competition that will happen in October, uh, the goal is that you have a squad that is organic to a company battery troop level to compete. And we're going we're gonna to limit that to five so that those other groups that still would like to compete for that squad 
that may not have a rifle squad, you could still use your tank crew, or you could use, if you wanted to, your medical team. Uh, so we're not going to limit it. And uh, we did up the rank, and I acknowledge that, you know, normally SART first classes don't lead our squads, but we're going to have some SART first class folks go through. And we've got a lot to work out. The XORD, I don't even think, has been out published out to the Army. But for this year, for the first time in the Army, at AUSA, we're going to announce not only the best warrior and the best uh, soldier uh, of the year and the best NCO of the year, but we are also going to announce the best squad. And that competition will run in conjunction with the Army Best Warrior competition. So first time. So please prepare your soldiers for that. And we look forward to running that competition for the Army. Okay, next slide. So two years ago, we said, this is my squad. Um, and how do we treat people? We talked a lot. Of, I talked about people first, what it is, what it's not. Lethality, lethality, and lethality. I'll keep on that. Um, but I do want to give you an update that I still don't think we have completely gotten our arms around, you know, what are our responsibilities um, to our organization in leader development. Um, it's our re responsibility in leader development to get down this concept of we know each other. We build off of our strengths and our weaknesses. And how do we do that? Um, what I'd ask is for your help. I think it uh, really, if, you know, if you're watching, you're in the room, a battalion or brigade sergeant major, we still need to expound on what this idea of, do we know our folks? Uh, do we take time to talk to them? Okay. Um, and I'm not sure we, we've really grasped this whole idea yet. And it's, I call it the, right now I'm calling it the frozen middle. So um, the, at the squad and uh, below level, they go, oh, this is really good. And then at the, the battalion level, they're going, well, somebody else needs to do it for me. Is that PME? Is it somewhere else? So how do I take on leader development and teach and say, how do you just sit down and have a conversation with your folks to get to know them? Do, I, do you even know the person that's sitting right next to you? Well, that's not the responsibility of the staff sergeant to be the end-all, do-all. I think at the battalion and brigade level, that's, that's your responsibility, is to teach those junior NCOs that you have this obligation. And how do you do it? What does it look like? Um, I think the expertise really resides in our Army. Um, but are we doing what we're supposed to do at that level? Yes or no? I don't know. I, I can tell you at the, at the Army Professional Forum, was anybody in? Maybe one or two, like two people? Yes, sir. Okay, you're at the Professional Forum. What did they say? That we still needed to work on our leader development. To what Capital kind of put out. I think that's where we need to go is that at that middle, at the battalion and brigade, we say, how do we do better with our leader development? And what are we doing with that? In reference to, do I know my people? Um, I think that's the frozen middle that I think we really need to address. Um, and if we don't do that, I don't think two years from now we're going to have some of those things in the objective that the Secretary of the Army talked about. And she says, reduce harmful behaviors. Until we say, I have an obligation to do my leader development in the middle, the battalion and brigade level, um, we're going to continue to see these issues in the Army, and we have an obligation to those below us to do that leader development. Okay, next. So how do we, we uh, kind of more operationalize this whole My Squad concept? Well, we put it in the NCO strategy. We published it, and I'd ask you to read it. 
there's probably, well, I know there's at least two people in the room that have read it, right? The Trade Act Sergeant Major and I. And, but have you taken the time to say, here's what the NCO strategy is all about? And it's kind of pretty simple. It's based off of, I don't know, cohesive teams that are highly trained, disciplined, and fit. And then we, we kind of articulate that in a document called the NCO strategy. And it asks you just to kind of pull it out and read through it. It's, it's a quick read. It's pretty easy. Um, but it gives the guidelines for all the NCOs. And it says, okay, talk to me about, you know, cohesive teams. So it's right there. We wrote it down. And what does it mean to be highly trained? And how does that articulate to the non-commissioned officers? Uh, and then it talks about discipline. It's at the culture. And it says, well, and I was just came from a group. Um, a few minutes ago, and they were just talking about it. I'm not going to tell you what group. Um, and they were talking and said, hey, we need to do better with discipline. I said, yes, I agree. And read the NCO strategy. We were right there. We actually defined that. Um, and then physically fit. Um, let me rephrase that. It says fit. And there's two, there's, I think, three parts to the, phys, uh, to the fit that most people get. They get the physically right, but it's the other two. It's the mental fitness and the social fitness that we're still completely missing. And I say this, again, this is all in the NCO strategy. Why are we still missing mentally and socially fit? Every day... Every day, everybody in this room got up today and did PT, right? Yes. Not yet. Yeah, all the heads are shaking. Yes. Yeah, oh, yes, Sergeant Major, I did. Um, in all the organizations that, we, that did physical fitness, um, did you practice any mental fitness today? Did you take time to meditate? Take a few moments to clear your mind and say, what's positive in my life right now? In this room, did you take some time to say, what is good about my life right now? And Sergeant Major Gunn's probably, behind his mask, he made laugh. He's like, no, I didn't say that, but I need to actually think about that. Because we don't do that. Not one PT session have I, I still gone to, to include today, did we take time at the end of that session to practice good mental resiliency? Do we need to do that? Yes. We need to practice this good mental resiliency. And how do I do that? Well, I mean, the technology's out there. We have Calm apps. There's apps for mindfulness. There's all these things, but we don't do it. And we go, wow, we know we really need to do this. Um, well, I would say, please go back, read the NCO strategy, and think of cohesive teams that are highly trained, disciplined, and fit. And then in the end, please don't forget about the, the mental and the social fitness of that. And then last is talked about this and I'll keep talking about is last slide please it's about ownership at the Army Professional Forum um, I said you know when you leave here what are you going to do with it what are you going to do for the information that we gave that still holds true to the, the entire Army what are we going to do about you know, the objectives that the Secretary of the Army just gave us. Are we going to do something with this? And what does that mean? And how do I take the guidance from the Secretary of the Army or the Chief of the Staff of the Army and then operationalize that down to my unit? And that's, it's something simple called ownership. That's how I look as when you come to this conference or you come anywhere and people talk to you about all these great ideas and how hard it is, um, do you go back and do something with it? You know, like that today was academics. They just provided you information. It's your obligation to say, I own this, and what am I going to do in my organization to make this better? Or not. Um, I often say, 
that we can write all the policies we want in the, in the headquarters, but it means nothing without you all executing it. You got to understand it, you got to read it, but you also have to action it. And that action is the ownership of whatever it is. So we have to own it. And, I, and now I will actually specifically talk to the NCOs. We have to own some of the things, right, that the Secretary of the Army kind of laid out. You know, recruitment and retain talent. I know we all own that, right? We all do, without a doubt. But, you know, we have retention NCOs in our organization. So that's that ownership. And if, if I'm not retaining the, most, the best quality, what am I, what am I going to do about it? There's, you know, and then what can the Army do to help me? So I think it starts with us owning part of that problem. But you have to, you have to operationalize where the, where the Army's going, and then you have to own it. And I think a lot of times we're waiting for the big Army to own it, and it's usually somewhere below that is the ownership. And uh, I'd ask you all to, to look at that uh, as we move forward. Because I'd like to say we all got it, we, we all own it, um, but it's not necessarily true, right? We always were walking by, um, and there's a lot of good analogies, right? Um, we don't always walk by something bad that happens, but psychology would even say, right, if we're all in a room, if, in a large room, and something were to happen, uh, we're, always, we're all kind of waiting for somebody to make that decision. And believe it or not, if, you, if we, there was a little um, study done, it says, if this building were on fire, and because there's more people in here, and all of a sudden you had smoke, and we're all sitting here, I'm like, man, well, Sergeant Major Hendricks is not leaving, so it must be okay that the building's on fire. But if you were in the room by yourself, you smell smoke, it's like, I'm getting out of here. <laughs> so that ownership you know, you're waiting sometimes for someone else to take the action because there's more people around. I'm, I'm telling you, um, that may not happen. You have to own it. You're going to have to take the action. I know this room should all know that, but I'll remind you of that all the time is that uh, sometimes we're waiting for other people to do that action, and it's not coming. Um, it's got to be us that own that. And I take full responsibility of that. Um, and that's why I take full responsibility for naming the wrong person who's in charge of the Maneuver um, Center of Excellence. So I will own that for the rest of my life. So please forgive me. <laughs> so I'll beg, sir, I'm going to give you a coin or something. I'll do 10 push-ups. I swear, right after this. Uh, on stage, because I owe you that. Um, and in closing, I, I want to thank our allies and partners. General Funk kind of led with that, and I want to close with that. Um, I, I do a monthly meeting uh, with the Five Eyes on uh, Microsoft Teams, and it's true. Um, we are stronger together with our allies and partners, and um, we're, we're never going to fight a war again without, um, you know, by ourselves. It's just not going to happen. It's very rare. So uh, I'd like to thank you all for being here, and then I will open it up for questions. And I have 20 minutes. SMA. Yes, sir. First question. Yes, I was Sergeant told Major. I have to ask you a question. Sorry, Major sure, Burgoyne. Um, I told you to ask a question. So um, this one pertains to the continuing resolution. Um, you know, we've had several uh, MILCON projects uh, at Fort Hood and within Third Corps that were approved. And then continuing resolution, we changed it. We pulled some stuff off. Fort Hood currently has an, a delta of 3,500 barracks uh, beds. We're moving it to 4,400 here shortly. What's the Department of the Army's uh, stance as far as talking to Congress on the continuing resolution? And do you see us uh, getting any further as far as MILCON? Over. Yeah. Um, if you go back, I think it was all service chiefs had to go testify on the effects of the continuous resolution, right? It was, I think the vice took it, the chief was uh, at a funeral. 
<laughs> so um, that uh, he was hosting. But all of the service chiefs went in and kind of laid out what this does. Um, adequate and consistent funding over time is really good for the Army. And that goes back to the number one objective of the Secretary of the Army, a sustainable strategic path. And every time we have a continuous resolution, it's hard to stay on a sustainable strategic path because we don't know what the budget is. I mean, that's kind of our position is, you know, and that's why they asked uh, the senior, the service chiefs to go and testify, all the service chiefs. So uh, it hurts us. And, you know, we can't start new projects. You can't start new MilCon. And then your funding is right here and it doesn't match inflation. And, and it hurts our soldiers. Um, so how do, we, how do I get that new MilCon project for barracks? Um, I can't do that new start. So... And like I said, I'm not, telling, I'm not saying anything new that you didn't hear from all the, the service chiefs, but uh, without you know, adequate and predictable funding over time, it's really hard to, to manage all the priorities of the Army, people, readiness, and modernization, um, because we don't know, you know what are we getting, what are we planning for, are we going to be able to start this in that year if we don't, we don't have the budget and that and what are we doing about it? And like I said, uh, the, the vice actually went up and testified and laid out in a really good articulate way on what this does to the Army. And hopefully that answered your question. But to that specifically about the barracks, um, I've been really consistent in our message is uh, the Army Material Command and, and I you know, when you look at the fa facilities investment program that AMC laid out, we had $10 billion over 10 years in order to renovate and build new barracks so that our soldiers can live in a, you know, in a good, clean, safe, and, you know, housing on our posts. Um, right now, I, I still believe again, based off adequate and predictable funding, that we're on that path. But every time we don't know what we're going to get, it's hard to say this is what we're going to spend in the future. Um, but we're still you know, working as hard as I can to make sure that our barracks are renovated and up to um, the latest standard that we can provide. OK. Any other questions? I'm the last briefing of the day. Is that how it goes? Yes, sir. Okay. Sorry, Major Grinston. Uh, yes, oh, yes, I'm sorry. Go ahead, ma'am. Where yeah, Yes, sir. Go ahead, ma'am. We go here and then uh, down here. Well, Major, I was just going to ask about Normally, I try to time it. Like, when will my first ACFT question go? Okay. Uh, we were three minutes into the question part. One April, ma'am. Take the test. <laughs> What that test looked like, I'm not sure yet. So, um, so I'm still extremely hopeful that on 1 April that you will have a four record of tests. Um, so I'm, we're still on that path. We're not off that path yet. Uh, the RAND study uh, was supposed to be out in December. That's what we'd asked for. We're not in December and it's not finished yet. Uh, there's been a draft that's kind of out, but not the final version. And I believe in the next two to three weeks, we'll have the final RAND study. And, and why do we need that? Well, well, because they put in the National Defense Authorization Act, the Secretary of the Army is not allowed to implement, full implementation of the Army Combat Fitness Test until you do an independent study. And that independent study has to be complete, and then we have to present that to the Secretary of the Army, and we're on track. I still believe we're on track uh, for that to be executed. Um, and I still think there'll be some changes with the Army Combat Fitness Test. Just like we said all along. So we said with, well, we've already changed, we're already at version 3.0 and it took like two years to get to that. Um, so we, we start off with one version, then we went to two, then we went to three, and I'm almost certain there's gonna be a new version of that. And you will find out my goal is 
um, probably before mid-March that, uh, that we have to inform the Army that this is going to be whatever the version is. Um, but that decision has not been made yet. But I'm still going with one March. Take the test. <laughs> And if that changes, I will personally, uh, I'm sure, I will be the first one to come out and say, okay, this is what we're going to do. But right now, 1 April, uh, AECFT, it's great. The more people take it, the better. We're going to get better physically fit. We absolutely have to have a fitness test of record. Um, I, I don't think we should wait. I don't think we can wait any longer. Um, um, you know, if I go to basic training, there should be a test of record. You have to take a test of record, and we can't just say, okay, you're good, and then now go to your unit. Uh, we have to stop that. Um, and I'm pushing extremely hard for that way to go. So, and, and everybody knows, we're not going to, the whole Army on 1 April is not going to take, because number one, you won't believe me anyway, right? Because April Fool's Day. Um, but we're still on track um, for 1 April implementation. And we make minor adjustments. I think that's not, I think the Army can adapt to a minor adjustment on the ACFT. Um, I don't, I'm hopeful there will be no bold moves on that. But again, we have to get the final version of the ACFT. Okay? That's not the answer you want. You want to go, this is what we're doing in this day. Um, but we're close. I got. I need you to say that in the microphone so we can record it. Yeah. <laughs> so, uh, so, yes, I agree. There needs to be an absolute incentive for folks to record it. And then for all the right reasons, too, it's like motivation to do better. But it's also, um, so if you need help, we can apply all those resources that the Holistic Health and Fitness team has got for you. Um, because... Right now, I can't. If you say I'm, number one, I mean, no, you'd have to tell me that you're doing, you failed an event. Because I cannot, you know, I can't pull up, you know, your DOD and your ID and say, you need to work on this area. And that's kind of, um, that's not what we've done for the other 30 something years I've been in the Army. If you're struggling with something, we get you the resources you need. It's not about kicking people out, it's about making us physically fit and stronger and better. And we have added a lot of resources to the Army um, the registered dietitian, the occupational therapist, uh, the physical therapist that's part of the holistic health and fitness. But when you look, let's talk about lethality, and TRADOC, we're working on this, already running a pilot that when you go through the basic leader course, an NCO will have the tactical strength and conditioning facilitator certification. So no longer are you just good at, you know, extended rectangular formations. And, you know, can you fall in? <laughs> this is PT. So all that has to come, but it also... It's also contingent on we have to have a test of record, and we got to hold people accountable. And I promise um, I'm gonna do everything and I, that I can to keep us online. And right now we're still on track. Okay, thank you. Yes, sir. Sorry, Major uh, Major General Gillen. We'd like to get your thoughts on uh, PCS stability. Uh, as we look to the future, uh, potential impacts. Uh, we're, you know, a lot of effort is going into synchron synchronizing through the ASARC and personnel conferences, trying to really, you know, hit the time on target per se with people and uh, operational requirements. I uh, just want to kind of get your thoughts on how you see that over the next three, five, ten years. Yes, sir. I, I fundamentally think we really have to do better. <laughs> so we are, we, are, we are doing much better than we were, but we are not where, you know, especially on the listed manning cycle where we need to be, especially when it comes to rearm. Um, and I don't, I'm almost certain we're, you know, open source right now, so I can't go really in depth about rearm, um, but I can tell you what we're doing about the manning cycle of the people. Um, 
So we did our first people's conference, right, hosted by TRADOC, where we had HRC, the G1 of the Army, and Training and Doctrine Command to say, how do we align and we align our manning cycles with how we're going to, you know, deploy the Army, and is that synchronized? And I'd say we're not. You know, we have to, we got to come to grips with that and say, what is that going to look like over the next three years, we look at rearm, and do we have the manning cycle tied to the readiness model of the Army? Right now, we have the readiness model of the Army, um, and then we have the manning documents. And we go, hey, go, go man people. And then they do it, you know, based off the requirements of, of what we told them, the active component manning guidance, but it's not in sync with all the readiness cycle. Um, and then... That's why we had the People's Conference. Uh, did I get that right? Okay. Um, and then the outcome of that was, yes, uh, we still don't have it completely lined up. And so I'll, I'll give an example. So when I go in the Manning cycle, um, does it say, here's the, here's the unit that I need to man right now? It just says, hey, here's what's available. So, which is a little bit about some of the discussion at lunch, right? Is how do I align, you know, what's the priorities of the Army versus, you know, the priorities of me? I want to go to, um, you know, Staff Sergeant Grinston wants to go to JBLM. Well, the Army wants me to go based off the requirements of where we need to go right now, needs me to go to... Um, Fort Riley. So there's the, here's a, the here's a requirement for the Army, but it doesn't mass up with the talent of me wanting to go to JBLM, and how do we reconcile that in a manning cycle that meets the readiness model? Um, so the Department of the Army is going to do three turns at this. So I think uh, we did the first turn on getting this better aligned on just manning, um, and then I think by the end of this summer, we're going to have a, a little bit more concrete methodology of how we align readiness and, you know, readiness modernization as you go through uh, the manning of rearm. And until we have that um, completely synced, um, it's going to, people are going to move more rapidly. And, and our goal, and the chief of staff of the Army has said this, is it would be really great, I even said this about our drill sergeant, wouldn't it be great if, if I want to go be a drill sergeant, but I know that I, on the back side, um, I'd like to go back to, say, Fort Bragg. And I'm at Fort Bragg, I go to be a drill sergeant, and then I go back to Fort Bragg, and that aligns with all the readiness of the Army. That's, that's really what we want to do, but I think we also need a system that helps us. So. Uh, IPSA A has to come online. We can't keep manning, you know, in a very short window. And how do we get more predictive in the out years so that I can say in my path, I know I'm going from Fort Bragg to Fort Benning and then go back to Bragg if that's what I want to do, or Fort Raleigh, or uh, Fort Hood, or Fort Bliss. Because right now we could just see in the next, you know, what's open in this cycle. And that's the future of where we're going. Um, we have a long way to go, and we need the system to come online to do that, meaning IPSA. Uh, hopefully that answers your question. It's a very thorough answer. So, yes, sir. Hey, Sergeant Major. Um, NCO promotions. So doing analysis on the Sergeant First Class Evaluation Board and interacting with Sergeant's First Class here on the installation and anecdotal um, cases, all, you know, in the operating force. I'm a sergeant first class. I'm ranger qualified. I'm a master gunner. I got an EIB. I'm fully CD complete. My sequence number was 200 last year. The board meets again, and my OML drops to 1,200 or to 2,500. I've seen cases and records of at least eight to 10 sergeants first class whose performance has stayed the same, but their sequence numbers dropped significantly. Um, is that an anomaly, or is this? 
how do we fix this? Because the message we're sending to the force is, you know, you're competitive for that one year, but that's it. You drop, you know, it's time to hang the spurs up. Yes, sir. Um, I'd have to look at each individual um, case to figure out, you know, exactly. It, I don't know, maybe there was this one case where they, you know, doubled the amount. But right now, the order of merit list looks at the eligible population that comes in. I could say there may be some really talented, you know, soldiers that just all of a sudden entered that population. I don't, I don't know. Um, I can tell you that the OML is not perfect. <laughs> so, um, and you know, clearly, I now I announced this at AUSA. And we said we're going to do temporary promotions because the OML, we had some glitches with the OML. And I, I, I used full disclosure that I'd screw this up. And I said we're going to implement temporary promotions to, from Sergeant First Class to Master Sergeant. And then later I said we're going to implement temporary promotions for all. And we're looking at, um, and that actually, we didn't really get the full numbers till January. So we're on month two of that. And I look at it every month. The goal is to go back to the OML and say this, every year you're gonna be reevaluated in your population. And you gotta to continue to do well in your rank. Um, because what we found in the past was, you know, people would get in their rank and maybe they don't perform well. And that's the whole goal is every year we would reevaluate you to say that you are performing well at the job that you've been given. And we want you to excel. Uh, again, for each individual and why they moved up and down, I would have to do more research. But the whole purpose of the OML wasn't um, to say, yes, you're, you're great forever, because that one time we looked at your records. Uh, but next year, we're going to look at them, and we're going to look at it the year after that. And that's all ranks to say, are you performing to the standard in your MOS based off that population that we have that year. And each year there will be more people coming in that population. There'll be a new group of staff sergeants that are now eligible. And that's who you're fighting against. Do you want the most talented individual we can find in the Army, or you want the one that's been in the Army the longest? And that's the whole goal of the OML, is to be talent-based and performance-based, and we evaluate that every year and, and then promote offer requirements. And what we, what we weren't doing it was that. We would say, okay, you're selected for promotion. We kind of guessed what the requirements were and we ranked over you by the longest time you've been in the Army. So uh, some of the glitches were, um, at some point in time, there's an old OML from last year, and we're trying to get those folks to school, and then this new list comes out. So when, the, when I evaluate the records, at some point in time, we have to start scheduling off of that new OML. But then on, we have school slots based off the old OML, and there is an overlap. And some people will go, well, how did a person, maybe I was 26 on the OML, and, um, you know, I'm now the new OML came out, and this other person is two, and the person who was 26 just went to school. It's because we're still working off the old OML, because the day we publish it is not the same day that you get a school slot. So there will be an overlap of OMLs. Um, but to your specific question, there's a new population that will come into that, and you may move up or down. Um, if your records were exactly the same, well, maybe there's 10 new people that came into that population, and they're really talented, and the questions we have to ask ourselves, do we want to promote the most talented or the most available? And um, the OML is designed for the most uh, talented. Uh, but if you find us not doing that right, let us know. Um, we look at, we literally will have a meeting every month um, because we're doing temporary promotions and the goal is to get rid of those temporary promotions and do select, train, educate, promote, get back to 
educating and training our folks before they get promoted. Um, but as we roll out the OML, that's why we did the temporary promotions. But if there's something in there and you do see a large jump, feel free to bring that to our attention. Um, and maybe, maybe we need to make another adjustment. Uh, I, no one's brought that to my attention yet. Like if I went from 50 to 1,200, you know, why is that? And if, if we can't explain that, um, I need to, to look into that. That's fair. Does that answer your question, sir? Okay, thank you. Got time for one more? Or is that it? Yes, sir. Okay. Um, that's like a that's like a loaded question. <laughs> so, um, so how do we, you know, for those that may not heard the question, so how do we build our trust with our civilian counterparts, all of them? Um, we have to knock down the barriers, and I'm part of that too, right? I mean, I have to go in and say, this is what you may not know any. This isn't necessarily about our civilian leaders. This is maybe about the American population. It's both, right? Um, so you can say, well, this person may be new to the Army, and they don't understand what are the roles and responsibilities of an NCO. It's my obligation to not go, oh, well, you know, I'm just not going to talk to that person. I, as a servant of the Army, I have an obligation um, to say, here's what's special about our Army, and here's what's different about our NCO Corps. Um, but we actually need to do this with everybody in America. And it's not just about the NCO It's about the Army. They, these, are, these are still these myths that are out there and they run rampant. It's not just in our civilian leadership or anybody else. It's our country sometimes go, oh, I'll give you an example of our country, and then I'll come back to the building. Is that fair? So very quickly, as I was at uh, this location, and I'm talking to the superintendents of a major city in America, a very large city, superintendents of all the school systems, and they had all the, the leaders of all the schools in there. And all of a sudden, the conversation, now I'm sitting in the room. And I'm with the Secretary of the Army at the time, with Secretary McCarthy and Congressman Crow. Right? So we're sitting there, and they all of a sudden start talking about combat arms. And then, actually, specifically, infantry. And I'm just, I just think it's the most fascinating conversation. And they alluded to that, you know, you know, the, the dumb infantry soldier, right? They didn't say it that way, but that was, you know, how they're going, yeah, you know, they're infantry, and, you know, they don't get it. And I said, I actually stopped them. I said, you do understand that some of the best leaders in the United States Army are infantry and combat arms. You do know that, right? And, you know, they're, they didn't know about their army. And I'm like, well, they're sitting right next to you. That person right there who's in charge of your army, who's the civilian, was a company commander in the Ranger Regiment. And oh, by the way, the, your elected official one, you know, Congressman Crow, was also in the Ranger Regiment and an infantry officer. Those two people that you keep bashing, you elected them. <laughs> and they're like, oh, wait, Sergeant Major. Well, you know, 
So we have to, I think we have an obligation, everybody, to educate those on what we do. And, and I say, the sense of what I have in the building is they are receptive, but we have to knock down those barriers and don't say, you know, hey, I don't know that person, they're new, or whatever it is, and you got to kick down the door. I do. You know, I do. I just go in and say, well, let me, just in case you don't know, here's what's special about our Army and what's different. Well, I was with this organization. Say the Air Force. What's different about the Army? What is different? Anybody can tell me in this room very quickly. What's different about an Army NCO and an Air Force Chief Master Sergeant? Anybody? Like, you know, but we know, right? We actually don't. Do you know? He's like, Sergeant Major, don't tell on me, man. I don't have a mic. I'm not answering your questions. So um, we have this obligation to teach them that. And now I'll give you what I've learned. In, and trust me, I am, I'm not saying anything bad about the Air Force. We have a great Air Force. We have the greatest Air Force in the world. But we are different. Here's what is different. In the Army, when you're in a platoon... What is the tank commander of one, one of the tanks? Who's in charge of that tank? A platoon leader, right? Who's in the other tank? An NCO, a platoon sergeant. So if you said, who is the, the tactical expert in the platoon, the platoon leader or the platoon sergeant? Okay, platoon sergeant. When you, who is the tactical air, air, uh, expert in the aircraft of a plane? The pilot, okay. Yeah, Whew, you had me worried there for a minute, right? Okay, so that's a little different, right? In the Army, we, are, we, ha we rely heavily on our NCO Corps. Now, back to the building, we're not like any other service. I think... It's our obligation when those that don't understand what we do and have that trust, trust goes both ways. We have to trust that they are willing to listen to what we're saying, and they're going to make the appropriate decisions. Um, and I think that's all of us. And do not shy away from those uh, individuals that are new to the Army. Um, and it's our job to say, here's what we do. And there's trust both ways. And we have to trust that uh, they're appointed for those reasons. And then it's our obligation to educate them on what we do if they're not sure. Uh, and we can't shy away from that. Does that make sense? Uh, and that's kind of how I feel about it. Does that answer your question? And this normally means that I'm about to miss a, a plane or something. <laughs> so um, so I appreciate, I, I appreciate uh, your time and... Um, I really appreciate, thank you for having me, and I hope I get an invite back, and I owe you uh, 10 push-ups, sir. So here it goes. You got it? You ready? And then uh, we're leaving. Run out the door. Hand release. Oh, come on. Hand release? Okay. Man, you guys are a hard crowd. No, your feet have to be together, sir. <laughs> No, you, sir, you got to say, Sergeant Major, you can get up now. Or clap or do something. <laughs> okay, thanks. Appreciate it.